Introduction is therefore, it is time for question period, the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. While the Liberal government is in the mood of acknowledging their mistakes, I have a suggestion they can acknowledge another one. That mistake would be the fact that this government refuses to make the cost of cap and trade visible on natural gas bills. Right, Mr. Right, Speaker, right will the Premier announce that mistake is going to be corrected today? Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, once again, I'm pleased to rise and acknowledge the, the work that this government is doing, Mr. Speaker, to address climate change, Mr. Speaker. The action of us doing nothing, Mr. Speaker, would have been catastrophic, Mr. Speaker. And that's why it's this government that acted, brought forward, brought forward cap and trade, Mr. Speaker, and our climate change action plan. As the member well knows, the uh, leader of the opposition well knows, Mr. Speaker, the decision to uh, put the uh, you know, the cap and trade onto the bills um, uh, within uh, you know natural gas, Mr. Speaker, that was a decision that was made by the Ontario Energy Board, Mr. Order. Speaker. They did consultation after consultation, Mr. Speaker. They talked with the industry stakeholders, and they said this was a cost of doing business, Mr. Speaker, and that cost, Mr. Speaker, will not be, uh, be a part of the conversation as they move forward, Mr. Speaker, but Answer. this was an OEB decision, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. That's lame. Mr. Speaker, back to the Premier. The reason this Liberal government does not want to admit this mistake is they want to cover up and hide the fact this is a cash grab. 1.9. The member has to withdraw. Withdraw. Carry on. The government is trying to hide this cash grab, $1.9 billion a year to pander to voters, not to help the environment, not to make a real difference. If it was anything more than a cash grab, they'd be open and transparent about it. This is a premier that promised she would be open and transparent, and this is the opposite of the. This is the exact opposite. So my question, Mr. Speaker, directly to the premier, in the spirit of being open and transparent, will you do the right thing? Will you make sure that this? cost is, is very visible and the government no longer hides it. Minister. Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Minister of the Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I really enjoy the Leader of the Opposition, the man with no plan. He has no plan to reduce electricity by 25 per cent. He won't support us. But he does have a plan, Mr. Speaker, on climate change, and we're so excited about it. He wants to introduce a carbon tax, a carbon tax that wouldn't put three cents on natural gas cleaner, it would put over 12. A carbon tax that wouldn't put four cents on propane, it would put 10, just like BC. He would put not four cents on gasoline, but 16 cents on gasoline. <laughs> You see it, please. I, uh, I want to make this clear, so I'll wait. Let me be perfectly clear. I was quite prepared to call the member to order simply because the members on his own side were making enough noise that I could not hear. And that's been going on since we started question period on both sides. So, you now know that I'm paying attention, and I'm asking that you let us get through this question period with reasonable amount of decorum between each other and for each other, particularly on the government side, when someone's answering a question, I'm hearing heckling from the same side. And I'm also hearing heckling from the opposition. Please finish. Mr. Speaker, Your back question. to the Premier. Once again, the minister is simply making it up. Uh, you know, yep. this is a cash grab, a cash grab, and the government oh, yeah. is trying to hide it. You know, Lori Goldstein uh, pointed out once Ontario joins the California and Quebec cap and trade market next year, all bets are off. Only 18% of the permits were sold last month in terms of the latest auction. Mr. Speaker, how much money will taxpayers be on the hook for because of this disastrous cap and trade? Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Let, let me just finish because he keeps on telling us. He I thought I was being reasonable, so let's go. The member from uh, Leeds Grand will come to order. And I think there was two others, but I wasn't quite sure which one it was. 
Carry on. He can't, Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition keeps on telling us that he likes this BC carbon tax model, which would add not five cents on diesel, as our lower-cost system would, but almost 20 cents. That would, wow. that would as he says, he would make, make him the best, econo the best leader Michigan ever had, to use his words. He All right. Member from Leeds Grenville, second time. And a few of you, a few of you, member from Simcoe Gray, are pushing me to warnings. So to to come anywhere near, and those are numbers at 20 or 30 or 40, 50 under the the federal government's cap, Mr. Speaker. That's the minimum Answer. amount. Mr. Speaker, that would be required. So if he isn't using the BC model, which costs four times as much as the Ontario model, Thank you. what is his position, Mr. Speaker? Thank you. <laughs> New question, the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Since the Minister of Education ran away from Alison Jones when she was asked this question, maybe the Premier will answer it for us. I'll give the Premier this opportunity. Mr. Speaker, very clearly, how many Ontario schools are under the threat of closure? Will the Premier please answer? Premier. Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we know that um, when it comes to uh, pupil accommodation reviews and uh, school consolidations, those are very tough decisions that school boards have to make. And uh, in, that's, in fact, why we've put a process in place uh, where they need to consult with municipalities, consult with their local communities. And what's, right. what's important to know that these are locally elected officials in their community that are making these very difficult decisions. It's important that we get that information from those local communities, and that's exactly what we have done, Speaker, so that when we're talking about school consolidations, we know that these are decisions that are tough for local, local decision makers, Mr. Speaker, and that we're getting that information straight from them. Answer. And that's exactly what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, my question again will be to the Premier. On Tuesday, the Minister said it's not about the number of schools. She wouldn't give an arbitrary number. Well, that's great because nobody wanted an arbitrary number. They wanted a real number. So I'll try again. Mr. Speaker, how many schools are under the threat of closure? Is it as high as the 600 schools the Minister previously identified? When will we get a real answer from this government? Will the Premier please answer? Thank you. Yes, so, Mr. Speaker, um, let's look at the facts. We have uh, a pupil accommodation reviews that are happening across the province. There are 43 of those that are happening, Mr. Speaker. We know these are very difficult conversations for locally elected school boards to have with their communities. Um, from Bruce Gray, of that, South. Mr. Speaker, there are 300 schools that are involved in those very difficult and decisions. Prince Edward Hastings. And in, in the 2016-17 uh, school year, through this very difficult process, we have seen boards decide to close 19 schools, Mr. Speaker. So it's important that um, you know we respect the role of the locally elected school boards as they are leading this process in their communities, together with their municipalities, with uh, with Answer. parents and with communities, Mr. Speaker. And we know that these are very tough decisions Thank for you. our boards. No Mr. Speaker, again to the Premier, Our Lady of Peace in Vaughan in Maple, 97 per cent full, and both English and French immersion stream, very popular school. But because of this government's pupil accommodation review, this government's priorities will close its doors. It's going to close. The school will close in June. The Liberals have made up their mind with Our Lady of Peace and signaled there's going to be a closure, and so there's an opportunity here. There's an opportunity to put a moratorium. I was disappointed that the Liberal members voted against our moratorium yesterday, but there's an opportunity for the government to take ownership of this and say no more school closures, and we will support the moratorium. So my question to the Premier is can she do the right thing and stop closing schools left, right and centre across the province of Ontario? Our students deserve better. Our communities deserve better. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. 
Minister. Speaker, you know, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the opposition talks about uh, what is happening in, in local communities, and I want to say that um, we have actually invested $16 billion in school capital infrastructure, <laughs> building. 810 new schools, Mr. Wow. Speaker, and 780 um, expansions uh, or, or uh, changing in the, the configuration of a school. And, Mr. Speaker, we're doing that to ensure that our students in Ontario receive the best education possible. And of that number, 450 new schools are in rural communities, Mr. Speaker, wow. with $1.1 billion in capital that we're investing. So, as we talk about what is happening in rural communities, it's important that we look at the fact that, yes, there are difficult conversations happening in terms of uh, reviewing the accommodation needs in schools, and there's also Answer. conversations happening about the investments that we're making in those local communities and building up— Member from Bruce Gray Owen Sound, second time. New question. <laughs> Member from Bramley Gore Malton. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my question, my question is to the Premier. Yesterday was International Women's Day, and because of systemic inequality, we all know that women are disproportionately impacted by skyrocketing hydro bills. Women like Valentina, who lives in Brantford, she says what keeps her up at night is not knowing when hydro bills are going to increase again. The Premier's plan is nothing more than a band-aid. It offers no comfort to women like Valentina, who can't save for their kids' future because they don't know when hydro bills are going to go up again. When will, this, when will this Premier understand that her plan is nothing more than a plan to help bankers and in, instead of helping the everyday people of Ontario, people like Valentina, who need a permanent solution that will actually keep hydro bills down? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the Minister of Energy is just uh, raring to answer the supplementary question, but I want to just say to the, uh, to the member opposite that it was International Women's Day yesterday. I hope that he had an opportunity to see the announcement that we made in the morning about levelling the playing field for women yeah. in sports, Mr. Speaker, because it is, it is extremely important, as we know. 94 percent of women executives say that they competed in sport and it made a difference to them in their uh, career trajectory, Mr. Speaker. So the announcement we made will mean that uh, provincial sport organizations will be required to have equity policies in place. We're putting money into training women coaches, Mr. Speaker. It was a very, very important initiative in terms of laying the, leveling the playing field for women in sport in Ontario. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sharon is a senior who lives in Sault Ste. Marie. The Premier and this government have heard Sharon's story before. She lives in only one room of her apartment because she can't afford the peak time of use fees to keep the heat on during the day in her apartment. Since the Premier claims that her plan is designed to help women like Sharon, why didn't she put an end to the unfair mandatory time of use fees that leave Sharon suffering at home in the cold? Chief Governor Whip, second time, Premier, Minister of Energy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, our plan, Mr. Speaker, will reduce those bills, Mr. Speaker, by 25 per cent. And specifically in Sault Ste. Marie and area, Mr. Speaker, if those folks live on the outskirts, if they're a Hydro One customer, Mr. Speaker, if they're an Algoma Power customer, Mr. Speaker, they're going to see their bills reduced between 40 and 50 per cent, Mr. Speaker. But it's not only, Mr. Speaker, it's not only, Mr. Speaker, Sault Ste. Marie that's going to see the benefits. It's right across the province. And yesterday, Mr. Speaker, when I was in Hamilton, the mayor of Hamilton, Fred Eisenberger, was in the news yesterday talking about our hydro plan. You know what he said, Mr. Speaker? Our government's plan to reduce our bills by 25 per cent is a very positive step for their city's hydro customers. He credited our government, Mr. Speaker, with listening to Ontario's and implementing what he calls dramatic reductions, Mr. Speaker. Yes, While the party on that side, they put together a proposal. Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I know their proposal is uh, is nothing more, Mr. Speaker. 
Finish, please. Wrap. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's nothing more than mis wishful thinking, Mr. Speaker, on that side. We're putting in place a plan that offers significant relief, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, women across this province are suffering under the weight of skyrocketing hydro bills. Women like Valentina, Sharon, and Meru Malik, a small business owner in Sarnia. See, Meru had to leave behind her family in Brampton, her husband and children, because of the cost of high hydro bills meant that she had to lay off many of her workers, and now she lives in Sarnia. And that means that she only gets to see her family on weekends if she's lucky. These women and their families expected more from this premier and this government than the desperate band-aid fix that they revealed last week. When will the premier stop putting bankers and well-connected insiders ahead of everyday people and the women of this province and put forward a plan that actually puts them and their families first? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. People BMW. All people within this province, Mr. Speaker, are going to see that 25% reduction. Small businesses as well, Mr. Speaker, are going to see that savings. And that's how, why, Mr. Speaker, that we acted. Because we heard, Mr. Speaker, we heard from Ontarians that they wanted more relief. We brought forward the 8% reduction, Mr. Speaker, but we heard that people needed more, so we acted. And we brought forward a 25% reduction, wow. Mr. Speaker. Their plan, Mr. Speaker, does nothing does absolutely nothing, Mr. Speaker, to help the women that he mentioned. Our plan, Mr. Speaker, will. It helps them in small businesses. It reduces their bills, Mr. Speaker, by 25 per cent. It reduces their home bills, Mr. Speaker, by 25 per cent. What they're talking about, Mr. Speaker, is not even saving a single cent. Answer. And their plan doesn't even mention low income and vulnerable people until the last page, Mr. Speaker. And they're saying, wait, we're saying we're going to act by Thank summer, you. Mr. Speaker. New question the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Yesterday, Freedom of Information documents revealed that the Premier knows that she is closing schools at full capacity based on a failed Mike Harris funding formula. Since 2011, the Liberal government has closed more than 277 schools. Can the Premier please tell the mums out there and the dads which of these 277 schools were operating at full capacity when they were closed? Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, I want to thank the member opposite for this question because the very reason why uh, schools are doing accommodation reviews is so that they can review and look at those facts, is, including the utilization of schools, Mr. Speaker, um, the utilization, the, the de definition of boundaries for schools, and uh, and to ensure that uh, that they are making the best possible decision on behalf of students in their local communities, Mr. Speaker. That's exactly the work that the school boards are doing in these reviews, and that's why we have to ensure that they have an opportunity to have this, right. this very difficult but meaningful conversation with their local communities, receiving input from municipalities, working together with their local boards. Answer. We've sent a letter just this week, the uh, Minister of Infrastructure and I, asking them to continue those conversations because they are important to the decisions Thank of you. the future of their schools. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, let me uh, narrow this down a bit. There have been more than 20 schools closed by the Liberal government in my community of Hamilton since 2011. Some of them, Crestwood, Eastwood Park, King George, and can you imagine, Sir John A. Macdonald, Linden Park. Can the Premier tell Hamiltonians which of these schools were closed while operating at full capacity? Minister. You know, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I actually just said in uh, in response to uh, a question that came forward from the uh, the opposition that we've actually invested in 810 new schools uh, in this province and 780 um, expansions or renovations, Mr. Speaker. Um, more than 16 billion dollars in capital infrastructure invested in our schools. Uh, we're continuing to uh, to make these investments, Mr. Speaker. Um, just uh, just a few months ago, I was in. Hamilton, and it's a great example of two school boards coming together um, to to make the best decision on behalf of their schools. Uh, the That's French right. Catholic School Board and the French Public School Board, Mr. Speaker, yeah. uh, to build one new school that will, in fact, have a community use and it will also serve the needs of high school, French That's high it. school students in Hamilton, Mr. Speaker. We are making these investments in local communities because they are in the best interest of our students. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, speaker, schools play an important role in Hamilton and everywhere else in the province. They support neighbourhoods, 
They bring communities together. Parents in Hamilton are absolutely furious to learn that the Premier has been closing schools that are full. They are furious that the government modernization plan runs contrary to the state community hub plan, and they know it. No one's fooling anyone here. Print, here's a couple more for you. Prince Philip, Roxborough Park, St. Thomas, and I could go on and on. Can the Premier tell parents in my community and across this province how many of these schools were operating at full capacity when they were closed? We want some details. Mr. 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 Speaker, um, it's important that uh, that we look at what is what is what are the facts, Mr. Speaker? What is happening? What because I just I just mentioned uh, to the member uh, that 810 new schools uh, were built, Mr. Speaker, and in addition, 780 expansions and renovations, Mr. Speaker. And when a school board is doing an Finish, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, when accommodation review is uh, is happening, it's really meant for the school board to gather that feedback in terms of the utilization, uh, the condition of the building, Mr. Speaker. Um, and and in fact, maybe a conversation like what happened in Peterborough, Absolutely. where we had two smaller schools yeah, that came together, Mr. There's a few people who know what I'm doing. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, um, like the example in Peterborough where Minister Leal and answer? I had an opportunity to announce $13 million to, to build wow. a brand new elementary wow. school with new facilities, Mr. Speaker, Rebecca. that will offer the best education for us. New question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and good morning. Uh, my question this morning is for the Minister of Energy. Last week, I asked you, Minister, about the electricity increases, 15% uh, wow. last year alone at Quinney Healthcare Hospitals. And your announcement last week won't actually roll back any of that. It barely addresses the increased cost of electricity going forward this year. Instead, what the Minister, Minister did was he sided with his big Liberal donors uh, in his energy scheme last year. Instead of siding with the doctors and the staff and the patients at Quinney Healthcare Hospitals. So my question is this: How many billions of dollars in interest is the scheme that you announced last week going to cost electricity customers in the future? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I think it's uh, you know very obvious, Mr. Speaker, that they don't have a plan, Mr. Speaker, so they're making it up as they go. And I know last week the honourable member put out a tweet that he had to correct Mr. Speaker on air when he said, you know what, Mr. Speaker, what we were saying in that is inaccurate, Mr. Speaker, just like the question, Mr. Speaker, inaccurate information in it, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure, Mr. Speaker, that all people in this province see a 25 per cent reduction. Hospitals, Mr. Speaker, because of the structural changes that we are making to the system, Mr. Speaker, they will see a reduction, Mr. Speaker, between two and four percent. That's significant, Mr. Speaker. But hospitals also qualify for many of our programs, Mr. Speaker. The Save on Energy program, for example. My hospital in Greater Sudbury, Mr. Speaker, yes, saved four hundred thousand dollars a year wow. by investing in the Save on Energy program, Mr. Speaker, and they put that back into health care, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Supplementary. Speaker, the price of electricity at Quinney Health Care Hospitals has gone up 34 per cent since 2012. That is accurate. Speaker, the minister had plenty of taxpayer money to throw around last week to bail out his government's bad decisions that they've made on the energy file. And let's call it what it is. A bailout is a bailout, and this bailout is trying to save the Liberal hide in the next election. He didn't have a dime, however, last week for the patients and the doctors and the staff at Quinney Healthcare Hospitals. So I ask the minister again, Mr. Speaker, how many billions of dollars in interest is his scheme that he announced last week going to cost electricity customers in the future of Ontario? How many billions of dollars? Mr. Speaker, we're saving Ontario ratepayers 
25 percent, Mr. Speaker, on all of their bills. The only person that doesn't understand about the billions that they're going to cost is, again, that party, Mr. Speaker, and they talk about ripping up contracts, Mr. Speaker. I know the honourable member recognizes that they can't do that because it will cost them billions, Mr. Speaker, because they don't have a plan. We have a plan, Mr. Speaker. We're bringing it forward, Mr. Speaker. We're helping businesses. We're helping municipalities. We're helping ratepayers, Mr. Speaker. We're making sure that everyone in this province will see a reduction, Mr. Speaker, on their electricity bills. I know they don't have a plan, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that they want to do, Mr. Speaker, is put a carbon tax on and then tax everything when they bring back coal, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? A member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. No question. The member from Kenora, Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Nickel Lake Lumber Sawmill employs 25 people near Fort Francis. It has seen its hydro bills jump 50 per cent in the last few years. Mr. Kendall Lundy, the owner, tells me he has just about had it and that everyone's jobs are in jeopardy. His competitors in Minnesota have hydro bills that are half of what he pays. What's worse is that he is subsidizing cheap hydro exports to these competitors, costing ratepayers like Mr. Lundy billions of dollars each year. Why does the Premier's hydro plan have no solution at all to rein in these wasteful hydro exports to, and reduce overall hydro costs? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Of course, I'm pleased to rise and talk about the importance of our forestry sector and, of course, the importance of energy is to our forestry sector. And I know the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry will want to comment as well, Mr. Speaker. But um, for us in Northern Ontario, we recognize that our large industry play a very important role, um, not only in our northern economy, but in the economy of Ontario and of Canada, Mr. Speaker. And that's why. Thanks to this government, Mr. Speaker, for Northern Ontario, we brought forward the NEAR program, Mr. Speaker, the Northern Industrial Electricity Rebate Program, Mr. Speaker, which is helping every forestry company within Northern Ontario, within um, all of Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. And that's why we're so pleased to see that our forestry companies and their energy costs, Mr. Speaker, are one of the lowest, not only in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, not only in Canada, Mr. Speaker, but in all of North America, Mr. Speaker. Um, no, start the clock. Sorry. The member from Timis, uh, Timmins James Bay will come to order, and he's about that far away from ask, having to withdraw. And he knows I'm not happy. Carry on. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I know uh, the company uh, in Thunder Bay, Resolute, they're talking about how their energy costs, Mr. Speaker, are some of the lowest in their entire fleet in North America, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work with our forestry sector, with our mining sector, to ensure that they remain as competitive as possible with the lowest possible prices. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, here's the thing. The Premier's hydro plan does next to nothing to help medium-sized businesses like Nickel Lake Lumber. The sawmill is too big to receive the 8 per cent hydro rebate, and as far as we can tell, it also won't receive the 17 per cent in bill reductions that the Premier has promised for small businesses. But it is not big enough to have the capacity to participate in the expanded industrial conservation initiative. The NDP's plan would reduce hydro bills for all ratepayers, including medium-sized businesses yep. like the Nickel Lake Lumber Sawmill. Why does the Premier's plan exclude medium-sized businesses from the 25 per cent in savings she has promised? I encourage the uh, third party to read our plan because medium-sized businesses will qualify under our new expansion of the ICI program, Mr. Speaker. You know what, Mr. Speaker? We lowered the threshold to 500 kilowatts, Mr. Speaker. So you know what? We would encourage them to look at the plan. But when talking about forestry sector, Mr. Yes. Speaker, I've got a letter here from Tembeck, a very, very prominent uh, forestry company, Mr. Speaker. Let me quote. Tembeck is able to effectively manage our electricity system cost in Ontario through our participation in a variety of programs. Wow. And as a result, electricity costs at the Tembeck newsprint operations are comparable to our operations in other jurisdictions wow. and with other competitors, Mr. Speaker. Wow. We recognize the importance, Mr. Speaker, of the forestry sector, of the mining sector, of our resource sector, Mr. Answer. Speaker. And that's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is bringing rates like with programs like the yeah. NEAR program that is helping all of our 
of our industry, Mr. Speaker. Good question. The member from the Port of Coast Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is also to the Minister of Energy. I'd like to thank the Minister of Energy, along with my colleagues, the MPP for Etobicoke Lakeshore, Minister Albanese and Minister Souza, for joining us uh, for a lively question and answer session with the Multicultural Press of Ontario. Uh, that announcement, of course, of the government's energy plan generated an extraordinary amount of excitement, the 25 per cent reduction of the hydro bill for all Ontarians, otherwise known as Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan. Speaker, as you can imagine, such significant savings for household costs uh, is a program, an initiative, not just for today, but for a sustainable program going forward. In my own district, the exceptional riding of Etobicoke North, we are blessed by a huge number of condominiums. So, Minister, I ask you, how will my condo residents benefit from the government's announcement Portion. of this 25 per cent reduction in hydro costs? Thank you, Minister of Energy. Uh, merci beaucoup, uh, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank the uh, member for Etobicoke North for that important question um, and also for all of his work on this file. He and I were together uh, the other night uh, talking to constituents about this. So, ensuring that all Ontario households receive this benefit is important to me and to this government, Mr. Speaker. So, I think it's important that we clarify. If you pay an electricity bill for your residence, you will receive this benefit, Mr. Speaker, regardless of whether you live in a house a condo or an apartment. In fact, if your condo has facility costs that are shared among the residents, these shared electricity costs will be also receiving this reduction. This is an essential part of our plan to increase the fairness of our electricity system in Ontario, Mr. Speaker. That's why not only, Mr. Speaker, will you see your bill reduced, but costs will be held to inflation for at least the next four years, yes, Mr. Sir. Speaker. We are proud of Ontario's Fair Hydro Plan and the signif yes, significant lasting relief it Thank will you. provide. Supplementary. I begin, uh, Speaker, by thanking the minister not only for this uh, program and your stewardship uh, resulting in this 25 percent reduction of Ontario's uh, hydro costs, but also uh, physically crisscrossing Ontario to explain the details to Ontarians. Uh, speaker, as you'll appreciate, after decades of neglect of our electricity system, yes, by parties of all stripes, it is heartening now to see that government is taking steps to secure an energy future that is clean, reliable and, most importantly, affordable to all. Speaker, I know that the 25 percent reduction in hydro bills applies to everyone, more than of the four million households in Ontario, and especially this is welcome in my own area of Etobicoke North. And the minister has previously mentioned that many small businesses as well as farms will benefit from that reduction as well. And I understand there are even more groups that will qualify. So my question is this, Speaker. Will the minister please share with, our, with the House how this announcement will benefit other households and other sectors of our economy? Thank you, Hi, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, I want to thank the uh, member for, uh, for this question and the opportunity to clarify this important point, Mr. Speaker. The 25 per cent reduction through the Fair Hydro Plan will Will not only apply to households, but to many other small rate pay payers as well, Mr. Speaker. This includes hundreds of thousands of small businesses. The vast majority of farms, Mr. Speaker, that I know the Minister of Agriculture works with day in and day out with, Mr. Speaker. Small offices of all kinds, including not profits, Mr. Speaker, and charities, retirement homes, long-term care homes, housing co-ops, community agencies. Those on retail contracts or with sub-meters, Mr. Speaker, and more and more, Mr. Speaker, will qualify for this rebate. The simplest thing to remember is, Mr. Speaker, if your bill includes the time of use prices, Mr. Speaker, you will be receiving the full benefits of this plan. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, this is going to mean major savings for these cross sections of Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and we're happy to be Thank implementing you. a plan. New question, the member from Niagara West Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Deputy Premier. Deputy Premier, in June of 2016, your government opened up applications for a Chief Digital Officer, a government executive whose job it will be to make life easier for people through easy-to-use online services and programs. However, it seems that this government doesn't want to actually make life easier for people, Speaker, because eight months have gone by and this Chief Digital Officer is nowhere to be seen. Once again, the Liberals talk the talk but won't walk the walk. When will the Deputy Premier, as Minister responsible for digital government, get back to work and find a Chief Digital Officer so that Ontarians can access the services and programs they deserve? Thank you. Deputy Premier, Minister responsible for digital 
whatever. Digital government. <laughs> Digital. Thank you, Speaker. And and I want to say thank you to the uh, to the member. This is the first question I have ever received as Minister Responsible for Digital Government. So thank you for paying attention. You know, speaker, di digital government is all about providing services for the public that are faster, that are easier, that are simpler, and that cost government less money. We are absolutely committed to moving forward on our digital strategy. Hiring a chief digital officer is very much part of that, and I will um, ask the member to be a little bit patient because, um, Speaker, this is a, an important job that we are hoping to fill very soon. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, my question is back to the Deputy Premier. Ontarians have seen the result of this Liberal government's bungling and digitization before. This government simply can't be trusted to get the job done. Let's look at the facts. E-health was an $8 billion scandal, Eight billion. and the role of the Social Assistant Management System, or SAMS, was a disaster. Now the government has been putting forward CPIN, the Child Protection Information Network, a cumbersome system that won't even have a searchable database. Consulting costs alone on CPIN have cost tens of millions. What will the Deputy Premier do to ensure this government delivers a digital system that is actually a service to the people of Ontario instead of another expensive boondoggle? Good Speaker, there are many initiatives that are already underway when it comes to digital government, and I have to say I'm enormously proud of our digital government team in Ontario. Speaker, they're doing excellent work. One example of this, and one that I hope the members opposite, all the members in this house have actually taken advantage of, is the new OSAP calculator. This is a tool, Speaker, that allows people, students, elementary school students, their parents, high school students, actually understand how generous and transparent our student assistance program now is, Speaker. What it means is that hundreds of thousands of students in this province will have access to the education because they have the ability, they've earned the right, they've been admitted, but free tuition for over 200,000 Ontario students and more support, people for more generous support. Answer. So having that calculator available so people know up front how much aid they can expect is a big, big step forward. Thank you. New question, the member from Welland. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. My office has been flooded with complaints around the skyrocketing hydro bills from people like Lorna Lampman. Now, Lorna has lived in St. Catharines, um, the, the, the whip may know her, uh, for 30 years and says she's never in her life seen a hydro bill so high. Her bills have tripled over the last few years. Her last hydro bill was $600. Lorna is in her early 50s. She has a decent job, but her husband is on a disability pension, and they find themselves having to choose between whether they can put some money away for retirement or whether they're going to pay that hydro bill. Why is the Premier choosing to put $40 billion in the pocket of bankers and ignore the very people like Lorna Lampman who need our help most? Minister of Energy. Mr. Of Energy. Mr. Speaker, um, thank you uh, for the question. It is important, Mr. Speaker, that we acted to ensure that we're helping people like the honourable member had mentioned, Mr. Speaker. And that's why the Fair Hydro Plan, the single largest electricity rate reduction in Ontario's history, history. will be providing a 25 per cent reduction for, the, for that family, Mr. Speaker, and for all families across the province. And while I don't know the specifics of that, that individual's family, Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Electricity Support Program is there to help those type of families, Mr. Speaker. And and we also increased increased the OESP program, Mr. Speaker, by 50 per cent and increased it so more families and more individuals will qualify, Mr. Speaker. So the OESP program is there to help. And on top of that, Mr. Speaker, on top of that, we created the Affordability Fund. Answer. The Affordability Fund will actually help them through their utility, Mr. Speaker, to actually make their home more energy conservation, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. to actually reduce their bills. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure that the minister understands because Lorna doesn't want this pushed onto her children and her grandchildren. 
And it's not just people like Lorna that are worried uh, about retirement that I'm hearing from that are struggling to pay their bills. I also recently heard from a young student in my riding who suffers from a disability. She expects to graduate soon. She worries about her student loans and the interest that she's going to have to pay when she's finished her studies. But she, too, is finding that choice. Do I put some money away for my student loan payments, or do I pay the ever-rising hydro bills? Speaker, why is the Premier continuing to support wealthy bankers uh, instead of the very students and people trying to retire in this province? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say that uh, that individual student, Mr. Speaker, will also qualify for the 25% reduction. But on top of that, Mr. Speaker, by the great work by the Deputy Premier and her ministry, all students moving forward, Mr. Speaker, are going to get free tuition as well, Mr. Speaker, and that's fantastic. So not only are we providing free tuition, Mr. Speaker, but we're working with folks right across the province to help them reduce their bills, Mr. Speaker. And yesterday, as I mentioned, Mr. Speaker, I was in Hamilton, and you know, Mr. Speaker, the mayor isn't the only Hamiltonian that is excited about our plan. Electra, Mr. Speaker, they're talking about how the homeowners in Hamilton will see more than 25 percent savings, Mr. Speaker. The folks in Hamilton, they'll see between 27 and 28 percent reductions, Mr. Speaker, because of our Fair Hydro Plan, Mr. Speaker. That's a significant savings for families and small businesses, and that's something, Mr. Speaker, I do hope that the opposition will support because it is helping all families right across the province. Well, thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, folks in rural Ontario are industrious, hard-working people who pay their taxes, put food on the table, put their kids to school, and take care of elderly relatives. And like, and like all other Ontarians, they are looking to get ahead and want our government to make life easier and more affordable. That was what I was excited that the ministers recently announced a new natural gas grant, which will help communities like the ones in my riding switch to more cost-effective fuel sources. Spending less money on heating their homes means more money available for their kids' education, for essential home improvements, or tuck away in an RSP. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please explain how the newly announced natural gas grant programs will benefit my constituents. Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. For, for the question. Uh, at Roma, I was proud to announce that we are investing $100 million to expand natural gas to underserved rural communities. <laughs> Speaker, this will go a long way toward making energy consumption more affordable for rural Ontarians, and it will leverage hundreds of millions of dollars of investment for natural gas distribution companies. Rural Ontario will have more access, affordability and choice, and greater opportunities for economic development. Access to natural gas infrastructure in rural, remote and Indigenous communities is a priority for this government. A natural gas expansion could save consumers up to $1,500 in heating costs every year. Speaker, the intake for this program will begin this spring. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Speaker, and to my thanks to the minister for his response. Minister, saving $1,500 a year will be a huge win for farmers and rural families. Providing access, affordability, and choice to rural energy consumers is something our government is focusing on. It will support economic development in rural communities, and that is something of which I'm very proud of. This grant program is fully compatible with the Energy Board decision on natural gas expansion in November, and most importantly, will provide meaningful support for our community. Question. Speaker, through you to the minister, could he please explain how this natural gas grant program compares to the plans put forth by the opposition? Thank you. Minister? That's, that's certainly an excellent question. The fact of the matter is, neither the NDP nor the Tories, Mr. Speaker, ever proposed any policy to expand natural gas access in rural communities. We are investing $100 million in this program in direct response to feedback we receive from rural stakeholders, such as the OFA and greenhouse operators. Our investment will leverage hundreds of millions of dollars in private investment, Speaker. Speaker, we're hearing absolutely nothing 
from the PCs on how they would expand natural gas to rural communities. The Leader of the Opposition has yet to announce a plan or even a single idea that would save rural energy consumers so much as one penny. If the Leader of the Opposition is serious about supporting natural gas expansion, then he should get behind our unprecedented initiative Answer. and support what we're doing. Thank you. New question, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Advanced Education and Skills Development. Speaker, the Minister of Advanced Education has uh, been in a role for nearly a year, and during that time, the highly skilled workforce expert panel report was also released. Speaker, why is this government ignoring its own panel's recommendation, and when will this government address the serious skills mismatch that exists in this province? Thank you. Minister of Advanced Education. Thank you to uh, the member opposite for the question. Uh, the highly skilled workforce report that was uh, prepared by a group led by uh, former member Sean Conway was presented to the Premier, and we are committed to actually moving on every one of the recommendations in that report. Speaker. There is a lot of work underway, a lot of discussions. In fact, just yesterday, I had a very good meeting uh, with the Minister of Education and the uh, Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters speaker, where we talked about how they could participate in that highly skilled workforce um, uh, report, particularly around experiential education. Speaker, one of the most important, I think, recommendations in that report is that every student, by the time they graduate from high school, and again when they graduate from university or college, have had one meeting full experiential learning opportunity. That's a big, yes, big shift, Speaker, and uh, uh, we're committed to achieving that. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Speaker. Back to the Minister of Advanced Education. Speaker, the Auditor General confirmed that youth unemployment rate here in Ontario is hovering at 15 percent, well above the na national average, which is clearly unacceptable. So my question is simple. Does the minister believe her government's record of high youth unemployment is acceptable? Yes or no? Thank you. Well, Speaker, the answer yes, clearly is no, and that's why we're working very, very hard to focus our work on, on those groups of people who are facing exceptional challenges, Speaker. And we are listening very carefully to what the Auditor General had to say about making sure that we're actually getting results for the money that we are investing in the programs that support, uh, uh, support young people as they get into the workforce, Speaker. I just do want to remind the member opposite, though, that his party, everybody over there in the last election, ran on the platform of firing 100,000 people. Those are the very people that support young people who are facing challenges to get through the education that, uh, speaker and into the work. Those cuts would have been disastrous, Speaker, and we are committed to making sure every young person in this province Thank achieves you. their full potential. Thank you. No question, the member from London, Fanshawe. My question is to the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Families contact my office and tell me how worried they are for their loved ones in long-term care. Over the past six months, 86-year-old James Acker has been brutally beaten and sexually assaulted in his long-term care home. The home has been cited for not protecting residents and staff from assaults, and the same home has received a written warning for not reporting and investigating abuse. Minister, your record on long-term care is truly disappointing. How many times does James Acker have to be assaulted before you take action? Thank you. Minister of Health, Long-Term Care. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, um, whether it's resident abuse or neglect or violence against staff uh, in a long-term care home, it's never acceptable. In fact, it's never acceptable in any of our uh, health care environments across this province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, regrettably and despite our be best efforts, uh, this uh, violence uh, or neglect or abuse uh, unfortunately and regrettably from time to time does take place. That's why we've created uh, one of the most rigorous inspection regimes 
uh, certainly in Canada and in North America, Mr. Speaker, using the best possible evidence. And I'm proud to say that for this home, as for every single home in this province, for the past uh, two years, uh, entering the third year now, we have inspected 100 per cent of our homes. When we do, we Answer. regrettably find uh, that uh, more work or protection needs to take place. We take it extremely seriously, and I'm happy to follow up in the supplement. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, Jame Acker's family is here today. Tammy Corbino came because you have refused to meet with her. The Canadian Association of Retired Persons have also lobbied you to meet with the Acker family, and you have refused. The Acker family knows that Ontario's long-term care system is so cash-strapped that resident-on-resident -resident violence is not being fixed, and one person who can change that is refusing to meet with them. Minister, will you commit today to fix the problems in long-term care homes and to meet face-to-face -face with the Acker family? Thank you. Minister of Health. Mr. Speaker, as I said, this is an incredibly uh, serious issue that uh, the member opposite has raised. Uh, it's regrettable that we should have to have this discussion at all, but it's a reality that we're facing. and So that's why we're taking a number of measures. And the, In fact, we've already spoken to, and I look forward to introducing uh, shortly uh, in the Legislature, additional measures that we believe are important to take to not only reduce and eventually eliminate such uh, violence, whether it be resident on resident or whether it be resident to staff, uh, that additional measures to ensure that those long-term care homes that need to do more, Mr. Speaker, are not only complying with the Act, but that we have the tools uh, in place to ensure that that compliance does not indeed uh, happen and, and take place. But we take the, this issue uh, absolutely uh, serious, Mr. Speaker, and of course, uh, if the family is here, uh, I'm not sure if uh, they're in the gallery, so I, I do see that they are here. I'd be happy to have some words with them and speak to them after question. Thank you. Question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. When our government announced that we were moving forward with the Union Pearson Express, a dedicated air link between the downtown core and Pearson International Airport, it was clear that this was exactly the type of investment that Toronto needed, both for the city's economy and for the environment. After going into service, it was also clear that riders loved the UP Express, but it was clear that the initial ridership levels weren't meeting our expectations. I know that our government was very clear that something needed to change, and that is why we took action to reduce the fares, an action, Mr. Speaker, that many of my constituents in Davenport had called for. I have heard that this course of action has had a huge impact on the uptake of the service. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update Question. on the current status of the Union Pearson Express ridership? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Of course, I want to begin by thanking the member from Davenport not only for the question, but on this particular issue and so many that affect the West End of the GTHA, Speaker, for her advocacy and for being such a strong champion. She's absolutely correct, Speaker. She is correct that after its launch, the UP Express ranked very high on customer satisfaction, but not high enough on ridership. Today, Speaker, we are celebrating a very important milestone. One year ago today, our lower fares for the Union Pearson Express came into effect. After lowering the fares, we quickly started to see the ridership grow. I am very pleased to say today, Speaker, that the UP Express ridership has quadrupled, with wow. daily ridership now averaging upwards of 9,000 riders per day, Speaker. That's great news for people visiting our city and our region and our province, Speaker. It's also great news for commuters in the west end of the GTHA, including those Answer. who live in the wonderful riding of Davenport. Wow. Thank you very much, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his answer, and I couldn't agree more. Davenport is a wonderful riding. And while certain members of this House jump at the opportunities to criticize our government's investment, it is very clear that it's paying off. Those ridership numbers show a huge increase from what we saw previously, and I have no doubt that they will continue to grow. And I know that some days it's been standing room only on the Pearson UP Express. And I know that since the fares have been reduced, I've heard from many in my community that the UP Express is now a real affordable option for them. Some members in my community who work at the airport use it daily, while so many others now use it as a way to move between the downtown core and 
and Davenport. This shows the versatility of the service. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please provide an update on who is exact, who actually Question. is using the UP Express, specifically how many riders are non-airport commuters like the people I've heard from in my community? Minister. Uh, Speaker, I thank, uh, I thank the member from Davenport for the follow-up question. She is 100 per cent right, Speaker. One thing I didn't mention in my initial answer, in 2016, the Union Pearson Express moved over 2.3 million people wow. between the airport and the City of Toronto, Speaker, or downtown Toronto. Also interestingly for us to note, Speaker, one year after lowering those fares, one in every four passengers, roughly 25 per cent, on the UP Express is a regular commuter, Speaker, taking advantage of the fact that Union Pearson Express fares Fares <clears throat> match existing go fares on that same corridor, Speaker. And I couldn't help but notice when the member from Davenport was asking her follow up question, Speaker. Members of the NDP caucus were making a lot of noise, Speaker. I don't know why members in that caucus wouldn't be supportive of more affordable fares, more options for commuters in the West End of Toronto, better transit service, Speaker, except to say, as is typical for members of that party, they don't have a plan, they don't have a path forward. We do, we're proud of it. We're going to keep building, Speaker. Thanks very much. Question the member from Bruce Gray Owen South. Thank you much, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is the Minister of Community and Social Services. Judson Harnick's 18th birthday was on January 9th, but there was no celebration. You see, Judson is severely disabled. He developed a brain tumor at three, suffered a massive stroke at four, and is at the level of a four year old, and that will never change. Sadly, this fact didn't stop the Ministry of Community and Social Services from cutting his supports in half to $860 from $1,900 a month on his 18th birthday. They also put him on the passport wait list, which we all know is a deeply flawed, messy and long wait. On behalf of Judson and his family, I ask, will the minister admit that the progress promised on the passport funding wait list has been a complete mess and a sham? Here, here. Thank you, Minister of Social Thank Services. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker, for the question to the member opposite. Um, I'm obviously not able to comment on this specific case, but uh, certainly I, my ministry and our government does understand uh, the difficulties that families can face in some cases where there are very challenging issues related to med medical complications for those with developmental disabilities, uh, those um, perhaps with some behavioral issues. These are very difficult and challenging uh, situations for families and for caregivers and so on. Uh, in terms of our passport waiting list, we are actually ahead of schedule in eliminating wait lists. Uh, we now have, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, actually increased by, uh, so we have some uh, 20,000 people now on passport. There's much more to do, of course, we acknowledge yes, that. But this is a program that is really transforming individual situations. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Back to the, to the minister. Minister, we have no idea what you've done. You talk about the wait list has actually been there. It's a 2014 wait list that you're proud to actually have got caught up on. This is 2017. At the end of the day, people don't expect a three-year wait list. They want action and passport funding when they need it. What they want, Minister, is leadership. They want to know that when the programs are there, you're not transforming Judson's life. You're making a mess of Judson's life, and he and his family are struggling because of it. The fact, Minister, you've been in charge for three years. Chair, the flaws in the system keep getting deeper. I want to know through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, how much longer do Judson and other families just like him in crisis have to wait to get real leadership, real programs, and real services? Here, here. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the reality is that we spend $2 billion every year supporting individuals uh, with developmental disabilities. Three years ago, we initiated an absolutely unprecedented investment in this sector, $810 million over three years. And uh, I think, as we all recall, that party opposite voted against that uh, particular initiative. And uh, looking at their platform back in 2014, neither of the opposite opposition parties had anything to say about these most vulnerable Ontarians. Our government is standing up for them, and we are doing everything we possibly can to help situations exactly as the members described. Here, here. Thank you. New question. The member from Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good morning to you. This week I attended the annual PEDAC My question is to the Premier. This week I attended the annual PEDAC conference where I had the chance to talk to many stakeholders from the mining sector, and this is what I heard, Premier. Despite 70,000 current jobs depending on the industry, 
We're, where we, we're way down on the list when it comes to investment attractiveness and policy effectiveness. Only sixth in Canada, where we should be first. Investors have no confidence in this government's policies. This Liberal government keeps saying it plans to spend a billion dollars in the last budget to develop infrastructure in the Ring of Fire, but, Speaker, besides lawyers, bureaucrats and accountants on Bay Street, where is the progress on this Ring of Fire? Thank you. Well, speaker, the, the member in one question talked about two different topics. He's, one moment he's talking about the Ring of Fire, in the first instance he's talking about investment in Ontario in the mineral development sector. So let's deal with the first half of it first. Fundamentally, Speaker, the, the member is wrong. Uh, the increase in the exploration sector in the province of Ontario is going north. It is getting larger than it has been in the past, and so I'm not sure who the member was talking to at PDAC, but I think that for those of us who attended that uh, conference on this side of the House, we are hearing a very, very different story. The industry is optimistic. They feel very excited about the way things are going in the province of Ontario right now. And actually, Speaker, the numbers, the raw numbers, when you look at exploration dollars being invested in the province of Ontario this year, the projection and the increase last year, speak very positively about what's going on in the province when it comes to the mineral, mineral development sector in our province, Speaker. So we're, we're very proud of that. And on the second half of this question, I'm happy to talk about that in supplementary. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, to the Premier. First Nations communities, miners, prospectors, and other people from industry are frustrated with the lack of leadership from this government. This Liberal government has a copy-and-paste approach to infrastructure plans in the last three Liberal budgets without actually developing even a trail even a trail to the Ring of Fire. First Nations are asking, as well as industry and many across Northern Ontario, what has this government done and where have you been? Mr. Speaker, the people of Ontario deserve better. First Nations are asking for action, and when will you start delivering results and ignite the Ring of Fire? Thank you. Minister. Well, Speaker, I think that if you talk to the nine-member Matawa First Nations communities, they will tell you very clearly what we've done and where we've been. But again, Speaker, this is no different than the question that was asked by the PCs a little while ago, where they want to frame the mining sector in, the, in Ontario in the context of only one project. And of course, Speaker, that is their goal, to make it look like things are not going well. As I said to the member from the opposition, the official opposition, there's currently three mines under construction in the province of Ontario. Exploration dollars are increasing from where they were in the past. And of course, when they're not, this is reduced or compared relative to global demand and global price. If the price is down, obviously exploration is not going to occur if they can't make money at it. Speaker, there's three mines under construction right now. The mining sector is doing well. Answer. We Support it. The NEAR program, the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program, is a big part of that. Currently, 10 mines benefit Thank from you. that. It's a competitive sector. It's doing just fine. The member from Nickel Belt on a point of order. I would like to deed to the uh, francophone model uh, parliament that uh, it do not copy at home. La députée sait mieux que ce n'est pas un, un rappel au règlement et qu'on n'aurait dû pas le faire. Selon le règlement 38 à le Action with this question given by the minister responsible for advanced education and skills development concerning skills. Concerning skills mismatched. This matter will be debated Tuesday, March 21, 2017. Before we move to deferred votes, I want to tell the members that this is the last day for our pages. And we want to thank them very much for the wonderful service that they've given to us. We do have a deferred vote on the motion for closure and motion to second reading of Bill 84. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
members, please take your seats. Smart move. <laughs> All members, please take your seats. February 21st, 2017, Mr. Murray moves second reading of Bill 84, an act to amend various acts with respect to medical assisted in, assistance in dying. Mr. Bradley has moved that the question be now put. All those in favour of Mr. Bradley's motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Knack. Mr. Knack. Mr. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Mr. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Thibault. Mr. Codd. Mr. Codd. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Darmer. Ms. Darmer. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Renil. Ms. Renil. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Ms. Jones. Mr. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Pettipees. Mr. Coe. Mr. Coe. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Monsieur Bisson. Monsieur Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Vanta. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 50, the nays are 33. The ayes being 50 and the nays being 33, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Murray has moved second reading of Bill 84, an act to amend various acts with respect to medical assistance in dying. Is the pleasure house the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. Opposed, please say nay. nay. Carried. Second reading of the bill, deuxième lecture du projet de loi. Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask that the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Finance and Economic Affairs. It shall be done. We have another deferred vote on the motion of closure of the second reading of Bill 89. Call on the members. This will be a five minute bell. I'm thank you, thank you. Because we're in the middle of a bill, uh, in the middle of a call, I will make that uh, call. We have the same vote. Same vote on closure. Same vote on closure. Carry. The ayes are 50, the nays are 33. The ayes being 50 and the nays being 33, I declare the motion carried. Mr. Coteau has moved second reading of Bill 89, an act, to, uh, an, act, an act to enact the Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2016 to amend and repeal the Children and Family Services Act and to make related amendments to other acts. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carried? Yes. I heard a no. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Opposed, say nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Call in the members. I heard a no. 
Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. Do not know how hard it is not to say something. Mr. Koto has to sec move second reading of Bill 89, an act to enact the Child, Youth and Family Services Act 2016 to amend and repeal the Child and Family Services Act and to make related amendments to other acts. All those in favour, please rise one at a time be recorded by the clerk. Mr. Koto. Mr. Koto. Mr. Nack. Mr. Nack. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sandals. Mr. Sousa. Mr. Sousa. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Dugan. Mr. Dugan. Ms. McCharles. Mr. McCharles. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Laney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Codry. Mr. Codry. Mrs. Mangat. Mrs. Mangat. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Domerlin. Ms. Domerlin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassy. Ms. Jassy. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Pot. Mr. Pot. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Ms. Rinaldi. Madame de Rosier. Madame de Rosier. Mrs. Marteau. Mrs. Marteau. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. McLeod. Mr. McLeod. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Mr. Miller Perry Salmascoka. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Pettipes. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cho. Mr. Cho. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Tabin. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Madame Jelena. Madame Jelena. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Campbell. Ms. Campbell. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. <coughs> The ayes are 83, the nays are zero. The ayes being 83 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Minister. I ask the bill be referred to the Standing Committee on Justice Policy. Before, before we dismiss, I just wanted to offer all of you some time for your family during this particular break, but I know and I want to go on record as saying that most of you work very hard during these breaks, on, contrary to what some people would re recommend. So I want to say thank you very much for the work that you do in your life. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.